Tonight, the intersection of culture and sport as Canada hosts the North American Indigenous Games. The start of a historic competition. It felt pretty surreal, like it's actually happening. A celebration of athletes and tradition. Unrelenting and unforgiving heat. During the hot part of the day, we're going back to our hotel. Extreme temperatures and expanded warnings. Plus, remembering an unforgettable wartime rescue. It gave them a purpose and a meaning while they were fighting over there. The true story of an Italian orphan saved by a Canadian soldier. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. Alberta and Saskatchewan elders dreamed of creating a national competition just for Indigenous athletes. Well, this weekend marks the start of the 10th edition of the North American Indigenous Games. And tonight, the gala opening ceremony with the arrival in Halifax of athletes from 756 different First Nations. 5,000 athletes from across Canada and the U.S. walked proudly into the Scotiabank Centre, watched by Prime Minister Trudeau and other dignitaries. As CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Creason Ascute reports, the importance of the Games is not just for the sporting events, but the positivity they inspire. Thousands of athletes from across Canada and the U.S. were greeted with open arms in Halifax today as the North American Indigenous Games opening ceremonies kicked off with much anticipation and celebration. With each team representing their nation, province or state. It felt pretty surreal, like it's actually happening. Andrea Daniels travelled from Mistawasa's First Nation in Saskatchewan to be here. She is competing in women's lacrosse, along with her three other family members who are also on the team. For me, it's a cultural thing. Um, I know that our people used to play back in the day and it's our sport. I find it really important to me and I find it's a big deal to represent our culture and then like the sport that's given us. And it's just a great experience for like Indigenous athletes to represent themselves. For the next six days, the athletes will compete in 15 different sporting events, including lacrosse, kayaking and volleyball. It's been like a very cool, everybody's kind of, you can feel like the anxious energy, like, like, let's get this going, you know, it's kind of like the, we want it to start. Indigenous culture will also be front and center, including here at the cultural village near downtown Halifax. We believe that the porcupine spirit lives on through the art. Mi'kmaq artist Melissa Peter-Paul from Abiquet First Nation in PEI has been sharing her culture with dozens of visitors. I'm here with my quill work and my son is competing in archery, so it, uh, it, it feels good. I'm glad it's here in Mi'kma'ki. The games run until next weekend and are expected to inject more than $24 million in Nova Scotia's economy. Participants are relieved the games are finally here after a three-year hiatus from the pandemic, with athletes taking part in the largest Indigenous sporting event Atlantic Canada has ever seen. Sandy. All right, Creason, thank you. And while the weather in Halifax was overcast today, Europe is still in the throes of a scorching heat wave. Temperatures are also dangerously high in the U.S., which is facing another threat, torrential rain and powerful flash flooding in the Northeast. At least five people were killed in Pennsylvania when they were swept away in their car. As CTV's Raheem Latani reports, Canada is also feeling the impact of global warming. From soaking t-shirts in a fountain in St. Peter's Square to nuns enjoying some ice cream, everyone in Italy is trying to find relief from the scorching heat that continues to grip 15 cities across the country. It's been dubbed Cerberus Heat Wave, named after the three-headed dog in ancient Greek mythology who guarded the gates to the underworld. We've got fans, we've got hats, and during the hot part of the day, we're going back to our hotel, and then we'll come out and see Trevi Fountain at nighttime. You know, take a siesta. In Spain's Canary Islands, wildfires have forced the evacuation of more than 4,000 people. Forecasters warn the extreme heat could lead to more blazes, with temperatures expected to intensify next week.
with the warming climate, every time it gets hot, it's a couple of degrees hotter. And that's the transition from being uncomfortably hot to really being a dangerous heat wave. Across the United States, 100 million people are under extreme heat advisories, watches and warnings. Temperatures have swelled to well over 40 degrees Celsius in several states, elevating health risks, with more than 9,000 Americans being hospitalized every year due to heat. There are a lot of people who are, who are, who are vulnerable to heat-related illnesses right away, the very young, the very old, people who are taking medication, people who are sick, and everyone has those in their population. And in Canada, the Hudson Bay sea ice has melted one month earlier than expected, which could reduce the polar bear population. While Environment Canada has released its temperature outlook through to the middle of August. I see everything being warmer than normal. And the, the red doesn't really tell you how warm it's going to be. It tells you how confident the forecaster is that this is going to be a, a verifiable kind of a forecast. With the dog days of summer still a few weeks away. Raheem Ladani, CTV News, Toronto. Well, drought is behind several European wildfires in Canada. Dry conditions are also fueling the flames. And today, the death of a second firefighter, this time in the Northwest Territories, where there are 89 active fires burning. Officials confirmed a firefighter died after he sustained an injury in the Fort Lard district on Saturday afternoon. A 19-year-old woman died on Thursday while responding to a wildfire in Revelstoke, B.C. A tragic incident today in Mont-Tremblant, northwest of Montreal. A man is dead and a woman is in critical condition. Police say a gondola may have been hit by a piece of construction equipment. CTV's Matt Grillo is on the story. Matt, do we know what happened? It's unclear at this point, but we know the glass that surrounded the gondola shattered and the gondola swung violently. Police say the two people inside did not have an opportunity to grab onto something and fell to the ground. It's unclear how high the gondola was in the air at the time, but they were about halfway up the mountain. Police say this happened at about 11.30 this morning. A man died of his injuries in hospital, while the other victim, a woman, is in critical condition. Police fear for her life, and she was transported to a hospital in Montreal. We do not know their ages, but we know they are not from the Mont Tremblant area. There was probably a machinery operating under this gondola, and machinery struck the gondola while it was moving. The two people that were aboard the gondola fell on the ground. The gondola is still attached to the wire. People in other gondolas had to be evacuated after this incident. The mountain is closed for the day, and the Mont Tremblant Blues Festival is also cancelled for tonight. A spokesperson for the mountain says they are collaborating with the Sûreté du Québec. So it's early on in the investigation. The SQ is still trying to determine, to determine the cause of this. Okay, CTV's Matt Grillo. Thanks, Matt. A major overnight earthquake off the coast of Alaska set off tsunami alarms, sending people rushing to shelters in the U.S. state. There was no big wave, but the quake prompted a preparedness reality check in B.C., as CTV's Ben Milger reports. Tsunami sirens blared in Alaska after a 7.2 magnitude earthquake rattled offshore. When a tsunami is imminent, uh you uh, you need to get to high ground and uh, high ground will save you probably want to be a, at least uh, several tens of meters above sort of shoreline within minutes the bc government began a series of tweets the earthquake is being evaluated said one no tsunami threat to bc the province announced about an hour after the shaking according to this chart tweeted by the american national tsunami warning center if there had been a tsunami it would have taken three to five hours to reach the bc mainland and Vancouver Island. Tsunamis move across open water at more than 700 kilometers per hour. In the event of a closer quake, a tsunami could swamp coastal communities like Tofino within minutes. Everybody plans for the, the worst case scenario, which is a large subduction quake, you know, just off the coast, and, uh, and that would give us 20 minutes approximately. In 1964, a major tsunami caused by an Alaska quake swept into Port Alberni, tossing cars and lifting buildings right off their foundations. 
Fortunately, there were no deaths or serious injuries from the five meter tall wall of water. In partnership with Ottawa, the BC government is rolling out new technology able to predict quakes moments before they happen, giving people time to take shelter or get moving to higher ground. Earthquake early warning, and in particular early warning for the big one off our shores, is, is becoming a reality. I think we'll, we'll be hearing very shortly about um, the implementation of earthquake early warning so that people can download apps and so on. I, I understand that's sort of in the time frame of the next year or so. The earthquake early warning system is scheduled to roll out sometime next year. Ben Milger, CTV News, Vancouver. Well, Ottawa will be calling on companies to pay back money owed after the federal government rolled out billions in emergency loans during the pandemic. But as CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver reports, some shop and restaurant owners say they're anxious about the looming deadline, especially in today's economic climate. More than a year after the last COVID lockdown lifted, Many small businesses are still feeling the financial squeeze from the pandemic. The more stressful part is now, but COVID was a ride I hope never to repeat. <laughs> to avoid a COVID closure, about 900,000 businesses, including Karen Tuff's restaurant and cocktail bar, took advantage of the Canadian emergency business account loan in 2020. It helped at the time, but now is a cause of stress. The loan's due date is quickly approaching. We took the SIBA loan to help get us through. We're not looking for a handout. We want to give it back, but we just need time. The government loans of up to $60,000 came with a big bonus. Up to $20,000 would be forgiven and no interest charged if the loan was paid back on time, December 31st, 2023. But in the face of inflation and high interest rates, business owners like Mohamed Raba want an extension. His small restaurant of 11 years has racked up more than $160,000 in debt since the pandemic started. To delay it for another year, postpone it for another year, till things like inflation comes down, inflation killed us. And he's not alone. The Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses says about 20% of all small businesses are at risk of closing due to their debt load. Extending the repayment of the SIBA loan by another year at least would give businesses uh, a more chance to get back on their feet, repay the loan, keep the forgivable portion. The finance department says it's already extended the deadline once from December 2022 to December 2023 and is refusing to say whether it'll do it again. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. And the Calgary Stampede closed out another year, encouraged by attendance at the rodeo. And what it all means for the city, CTV's Nicole DiDonato reports. Enjoy the rest of your stay. More than a million people have put on their cowboy boots and hats to take in the greatest outdoor show on earth. Each year, Stampede Park transforms into its own city, the third largest in the province for 10 days. Extreme heat, smoke, rain, and even hail didn't stop people from enjoying the midway music and rodeo. Neither did the costs. With the Stampede Super Pass, I've just been here every single day spending a copious amount of money. After two years of significant financial losses due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Stampede bounced back with $13 million in revenue last year. Officials believe they'll be back in the black again this year and likely by a more significant margin. This is what we really need to set our footing going forward. Uh, we've taken on a lot of debt over the past couple of years. We have a lot of deferred maintenance with regard to the facilities on park that need to be addressed. <laughs> Restaurants have been banking on the extra business. This is Porch's second stampede and by far the busiest. The 17th Avenue restaurant says they're now becoming a tourist highlight. I feel like with all the tourists coming into town as well, it's been great. And like I feel hotels have been um, recommending us, which is amazing. A welcome boost for Calgary's hotel industry too. When the uh, stampede broke their Friday record, we broke our hotel record as well. Arguably, we're going to see more revenue during the 10 days of Stampede, really 12 nights, uh, than the entire year of 2020. Stampede officials say they'll take a quick break, but we'll get right back to planning for next year's greatest outdoor show on earth, which is set for July 5th to 14th. Nicole DiDonato, CTV News, Calgary. Coming up after the break, a new message from Moscow on Ukraine's counteroffensive. Plus, Remembering a style icon and the bag that bears her name.
a threat to Ukraine today from Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, warning he has a stockpile of cluster munitions and is not afraid to use them. Putin was responding to the U.S. decision to send the controversial bombs to Ukraine. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. With Ukrainian forces now in possession of controversial U.S. cluster bombs, Russian President Vladimir Putin told a pro-Kremlin news outlet he's prepared to retaliate. The Russian Federation has a sufficient stockpile of cluster munitions, Putin warns. If they are used against us, we will take reciprocal action. While Putin claims his forces have not used the indiscriminate weapons in Ukraine, the United Nations report in March accused Russia of using cluster bombs at least 24 times. More than 100 countries, including most NATO allies and Canada, signed a convention to ban the explosives. Protesters in Germany slammed leaders for not doing more to stop the U.S. from sending them to Ukraine. These shows the horrible double standard of German and European politics. Cluster munitions scatter explosives across a wide area, though some fail to detonate and lay waiting for unsuspecting civilians, often children. Providing cluster munitions fills a gap for Ukraine, and the president was determined not to leave Ukraine defenseless. The U.S. fears Ukraine will run out of ammunition during its crucial counteroffensive. The situation on the ground is a lot more dire than anybody is willing to admit publicly. Despite a lack of battlefield breakthroughs, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky promised his country will never give up its sovereignty. This ship is carrying Ukrainian grain, vital to the country's fledgling economy, though it may be the last to travel the Black Sea unless Russia extends an international agreement. With the humanitarian consequences of cluster bombs weighing heavily on NATO allies, Ukraine is promising to use them away from densely populated areas. Sandy? All right, Kevin, thank you. The late Princess Grace of Monaco made the Hermes Birkenbag famous, but British actress, singer, and fashion maven Jane Birkin was the inspiration for the iconic purse. Birkin died today. Born in London, she moved to France and made her mark there, becoming synonymous with the French chic style. Birkin was found dead in her home at age 76. She had health issues. Time for a break, but when we come back, devastated by drought, the financial and mental fallout. Farmers in Western Canada are feeling the heat after another summer of endless drought. The stress of losing crops and making ends meet is taking a toll on mental health, something many keep hidden. CTV's Donovan Mace reports. We've done our part, it's just we need some rain. In parts of Saskatchewan, producers are facing a fifth year of consecutive drought. Much of the western parts of the province are under moderate drought conditions, while some areas in the southwest are experiencing severe drought. Your payments are pretty high and you got to farm more acres to make it all justify. And when it doesn't rain, those acres don't produce the bushels or the money and then everybody's in tough. According to a Saskatchewan Polytechnic study, stresses like weather, pests and increasing input costs are key contributors to higher anxiety and depression rates among farmers and ranchers. Producers around the province are certainly feeling it, especially in the areas that have been impacted by such a significant drought. Pavlov says historically there is a stigma surrounding mental health in farming culture and it's harder for farmers to seek out supports. We're finding that um, the lack of general understanding of farm culture has really um, been difficult for producers to, you know, seek mental health care that's culturally appropriate to them. It takes a lot of courage to, to be able to say, hey, I, I need help. That's something farm-centered mental health support group Do More Egg 
is hoping to change. The importance of having someone who knows is extremely important uh, in building that therapeutic relationship. Reynolds says it's important to be aware when burnout is happening and to look for ways to recharge. We don't pull out the combine and go straight into the field. We get it out and we go through it and we change things and we replace things. We make sure it's in the best shape it can be. Uh, we need to think of ourselves the same way. Don Vinme, CTV News, Regina. Still ahead, Gino's wartime journey. The Italian orphan who bonded with a Canadian soldier. Farmers in Western Canada are feeling the heat after another summer of endless drought. The stress of losing crops and making ends meet is taking a toll on mental health, something many keep hidden. CTV's Donovan Mace reports. We've done our part, it's just we need some rain. In parts of Saskatchewan, producers are facing a fifth year of consecutive drought. Much of the western parts of the province are under moderate drought conditions, while some areas in the southwest are experiencing severe drought. Your payments are pretty high and you got to farm more acres to make it all justify. And when it doesn't rain, those acres don't produce the bushels or the money and then everybody's in tough. According to a Saskatchewan Polytechnic study, stresses like weather, pests, and increasing input costs are key contributors to higher anxiety and depression rates among farmers and ranchers. Producers around the province are certainly feeling it, especially in the areas that have been impacted by such a significant drought. Pavlov says historically there is a stigma surrounding mental health in farming culture, and it's harder for farmers to seek out supports. We're finding that um, the lack of general understanding of farm culture has really um, been difficult for producers to, you know, seek mental health care that's culturally appropriate to them. It takes a lot of courage to, to be able to say, hey, I, I need help. That's something farm-centered mental health support group Do More Egg is hoping to change. The importance of having someone who knows is extremely important uh, in building that therapeutic relationship. Reynolds says it's important to be aware when burnout is happening and to look for ways to recharge. We don't pull out the combine and go straight into the field. We get it out and we go through it and we change things and we replace things. We make sure it's in the best shape it can be. Uh, we need to think of ourselves the same way. Don Vinme, CTV News, Regina. Still ahead, Gino's wartime journey. The Italian orphan who bonded with a Canadian soldier.